Hello, everyone. So I am currently live, just trying to figure out my settings on my computer. Uh, if anyone is there, please let me know in the comments at the moment so I can see. Yes. OK, so we are here. That is great. So I'm just going to minimize uh, this or maybe I should move it or maybe I should share my whole window. That will probably be a better thing to do. I feel like such a noob with this, but just hear me out. So if I do entire screen and just select the screen, there we go. OK, so that is looking much better. So, hey, everyone, and welcome to my introduction to coding. This is a one hour coding introduction based on my course Code with Anya Kubo. Uh, if you want to check it out, I will put the link in the description or you could just go to codewithania.com and check it out. This is a stream for anyone who's essentially never touched coding before. So we're going to go completely new, like completely from scratch, right? So you're going to learn about how to actually write code using code editors. And then we're going to learn about HTML. So the very fundamentals of coding. Uh, so I hope you're excited. Now, before we get going, I'm just going to maybe make this a little bit bigger. So that is looking great. And let's kick it off. So before we get going, how many of you have, you know, literally never touched a code editor before? Do we have any people who have never, ever even opened a code editor? Because if you haven't, then you're in the right place. Or if you have, then just bear with me for five minutes while I introduce them and show you how to essentially get your first, first code editor working. So great. So code editors. What even is a code editor? Uh, well, there are a few code editors. It's essentially like, you know, when you write a document or you're using Word or Google Sheets or something like that, we have specific softwares for writing code. Our options are a text editor, so literally something like uh, Google Docs or, you know, Word or something like that. You can actually write code in that. I wouldn't recommend it because you don't get many of the helpers that many code editors give you, but it is possible. The other one we have is an actual code editor. So this one works like the text editor, but gives you a little prompt. Uh, sometimes now you get plugins that actually tell you if the code you've written in is correct, or if you have like a spelling mistake or something like that. So they're really great. And it version up is an IDE. And essentially this is an integrated development environment and it does what a code editor does plus more. Now, we won't be using it for this tutorial, but just bear in mind that that does exist. IDEs also exist. So what are our options? This is a great question because there are many. We have some offline options. And by this, I mean, you know, things that you can essentially download onto your laptop. So we have Visual Studio Code, that is a popular one. We have WebStorm, and that is the one that I tend to use the most, as well as Atom and Sublime Text. So these are ones that you literally download onto your computer. Uh, however, there are also online options, which means you just visit a URL. You don't need to download anything and you can get to coding straight away. So it's up to you, like whatever option suits your needs the most um, is the option that I would recommend. But I'm going to show you them now. So again, here are offline options and here are some online options for us. So if I go ahead and I'm just going to, let's go ahead and get some Google up. So I'm just gonna go ahead and open up a new window. So an online one is something like CodePen, right? So you can visit CodePen and here you will essentially get many different code pens to work with. You can start coding straight away and it will give you uh, an HTML document, a CSS document and a JS document. Like I said, we are going to be learning HTML. So this is kind of already set up for you and you can kind of write stuff like an H1 element, which we will be showing later. And essentially that shows up in the browser here. So that is something you can do. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you how to do this completely from scratch, though, using an offline editor. So this is definitely more professional. I don't think if you get a job as a software developer, they're going to make you use one of these. This is just kind of more for learning purposes, right? So 
let's go ahead and download VS Code. So if you're following along, please visit VS Code. Code.visualstudio.com is the URL that I'm going to ask you to visit. And just go ahead and download the code editor version. So for me, it's going to be Mac as I am using a Mac. Uh, and I just go ahead and download this. But I'm obviously not going to do it because I already have it on my computer. But please go ahead and download this now. I'm going to wait a bit for those kind of following along. Once again, just download it here. Um, there are other options. There's Windows, there's Linux. There's so many options to choose from. Um, so just go ahead and do that. Krishna says she wants a, or he wants a job in tech without tech background. To be fair, I didn't have a CS degree, a computer science degree at all. I did a coding bootcamp a while back. So I genuinely didn't know any coding before I started. It wasn't even on my radar. So when I decided to do that, it was a three month intensive course. And by the end, I had a bunch of projects. I had my portfolio built out in order to go and start approaching uh, hiring managers. So that's how that kind of worked out and how I got my first job in tech. So a computer science degree is definitely not a requirement anymore uh, in order to get a job as a software developer. So yeah, thanks for that question. If anyone's got any other questions, then please do let me know. I'm just here to answer all of them for you. Okay, so once that is downloaded, this is essentially what it should look like. You should see it here. Uh, and then all I would do is just open it up. So in fact, this is a project that I was working on and I can go ahead and create a new one too. But, you know, I'm not going to do it for now. I'm actually just going to shut this down. Okay. So once that is done, let's continue on our learning mission. So let's go back to our slides. So the first thing you need to know when dealing with code editors, especially the ones that are offline, is that we need to start organizing files. So this is essentially how an app uh, is originally stored when someone is working on it locally, meaning on their local computer. And it really is that easy. OK, we're just going to make a folder wherever we want. I'm going to make it on my desktop just to make it more visually obvious to you what I'm doing. But of course, you can save it wherever you want. And in it, I have chosen, so this is my choice, to organize my files like this. So I made a file. So this is the root of my project, this index.html file. We're going to call it an index.html file. If I want extra pages to my website, because in this case, we're making a portfolio, I would make a folder called pages. And in it, I would store the other pages that make up my website. So maybe like an about me page or a contact me page, the choice is up to you. Then I would then I would make a folder for my CSS. And CSS is actually the styling. It's what makes everything look kind of pretty on a page because HTML is all about the foundation. So the building blocks, but we will cover that in a bit. And then we have JS. JavaScript is uh, another folder that I've made that's going to hold my JavaScript file and is essentially what makes stuff work, like the magic that makes our button actually do something if we click on it. That's all down to JavaScript. Of course, there are many other programming languages, but on this occasion, I'm going to be showing you, if you choose to continue with this, how to use JavaScript. Yes, Vansh says the HTML is the bones. That's correct. I would also say it's the bones, the structure, the building blocks, whatever you want to call it. And then I have also a folder for assets. In this case, my portfolio just has some images. So I've made a folder called images. So essentially, that's what we're going to do. Let's start off creating this folder first and then creating this index HTML file first. And then if we have time, we'll create a folder called pages and create the other two pages for our portfolio. Now, when it comes to naming things, I wouldn't really choose to use a capital. This is because sometimes this will not get picked up. Uh, and basically, the, uh, when it comes to coding, you will notice that if you put something in capital or if you put something not in capital, that is very important. So just keep note of that. Just make sure to, you know, keep everything in small cases for naming projects so you don't get any funky behavior or when, Nick, when it comes to naming files. The same goes for having spaces. Now, for those of you who have ever looked at a Twitter URL, you might even notice that 
You know, if you share a tweet, so there is a cool thing on Twitter where you can pre-write a tweet and send the link to someone. And if they get the link, they will get the tweet and we'll open up some text where we can construct that text in the URL. But all the spaces will actually be represented with this sometimes. So this is also problematic. We don't want this. This is why I wouldn't recommend using spaces when naming things, especially folder structure. I would use a dash instead. So just make sure to also keep that in mind when you're naming stuff, which we're going to do next. So once again, stick to lowercase, avoid spaces, and actually avoid underscores too, just stick to dashes. This is some advice I have for naming files. Uh, what if images are added with caps? Do I change them or hash? I would just rename them, to be honest, uh, to have everything lowercase, kind of keeping the same naming conventions that we have here. But yeah, that is my uh, opinion. JPEG or PNG, that is completely up to you. There's also th things called web, uh, web MIPS files. <laughs> I'm not pronouncing that right, which are actually probably better because they take much less time to load, especially on a website. Great. So yeah, let's carry on. Let's get to creating our first project. So like I said, it's going to check my battery 11%. All I'm going to do is create a new folder. So everyone just go ahead and create a folder on your computer. It really is this easy. When I first started coding, I was just like so overwhelmed. I'm like, how do we even get this piece of writing to appear in the browser? Like what is going on? It's really simple. I'm going to show you. And you'll, maybe some of you might be like, whoa, because that's what I was like. So let's go ahead and call this my portfolio. Notice I'm using all lowercase and no spaces. I'm just using a dash. Um, okay, and then once in here, what did I say? Well, I'm just gonna actually open this up in Visual Studio first. So here is Visual Studio and I can go ahead and open. And then on my desktop, I can open that folder that we just made, right? So if I open it, there it is. It's got nothing in here and I can then choose to create a file. Now, we said we want to create an HTML file because this is the building blocks, this is the foundation of all of this, and I'm going to call it index. You can call it whatever you want, but again, uh, best practice is to call it index, and then I'm going to use .html, and you'll notice this changes, oh, because our code editor knows to treat this as an HTML file. So essentially pick up HTML code as opposed to something like .css, then this changes and it will treat it like a CSS file. So that is important. Make sure to name it right. You should get this image right here if you're using VS code. So now if I hit enter, that will produce that index HTML file that's in my portfolio. And actually what is cool is that if you look in here, so that's my portfolio, right? Is this folder that we made. There is the file, okay? We've just created it. So I could also do it here, sure, why not? Uh, it might be a bit more difficult though. I don't think I've ever done it this way. Um, can we? Perhaps we can drag and drop it from somewhere else. Maybe it's not possible. I'm sure there's a way, but what I would do is not that. <laughs> I would create it here. So once again, you would go here and I go test.html and there it shows up. And then we can delete it from here. So let's go ahead and delete this, move to bin. And then it gets taken away from that. So that's just to show you the connection between the files on your computer and what's happening in the code editor, right? So hopefully that makes sense. Hey, Najaf, nice to see you here. I know that you're watching my uh, Threads app yesterday and you said you were going to come, so it's nice to see you. Uh, great, let's carry on. So here's our index HTML page, okay? And what we can do to view this in the browser is this. So all I would do is copy the path and then get my browser up again. And then just paste the path. So essentially what is happening here 
is we're going onto my computer, into users and your Kubo, onto my desktop, into the folder we just made called my portfolio, and then we're getting that index HTML file, we're serving it up to the browser. So at the moment, if I inspect, so I'll, this is something you can do, just press control, left click on your browser and click inspect, and this will essentially show you the HTML document, okay? So great, and next we actually have to add elements in here. So by default, it will give you, uh, it will say that it's an HTML document and start with the head and body. So let's go ahead and explore what these things mean next. So let's do it. So let's go back to our files, our presentation, sorry. which I believe is here, okay. So HTML, what exactly is HTML? Well, it actually starts, stands for Hypertext Markup Language. Uh, and what we're gonna do is learn what HTML is exactly, the origins of HTML, then about HTML elements and their syntax. So essentially, how you write HTML. And we're gonna be doing this to create our first projects. Now in the Code with Anya course, there is a bunch more projects that you learn. So this is like just the beginning of the first one. Uh, and if you want to, in fact, I'm gonna write it in here. I love coding will give you 20% off if you want to check that out. So great, let's get to it. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language and is something that we use to describe the structure of web pages. So for example, think of it like this. So markup language, imagine you're a teacher and you have an essay or some text uh, submitted to you by your student. Now, the student's made some spelling mistakes, and he's like, put something that is uh, not meant to be capital in there. And as a teacher, you go with your red pen and you change it. It's not actually meant to be seen on the final product, right? The student will then come back, uh, will go and then make these changes. And that is essentially what markup language is and kind of where it comes from, essentially. So you're just going in with HTML and saying, ah, oh, this text needs to be bold or this text needs to be uh, blue. No, sorry, not blue, that's CSS. This text needs to be uh, italic and so on. And that's what we're going to be doing with HTML. So, for example, we can take some boring text that looks like this, okay, and use HTML elements to make it look like this. So, it's the same thing ingredients for macaroni and cheese, ingredients for macaroni and cheese. So, as you might have seen with this little tag here and this little tag here, making this heading look like this, this is actually HTML syntax. So, syntax. Now, syntax actually essentially means that, right, is a kind of, um, I don't know what to say, approach is the structure of statements in a computer language. So HTML will have a certain syntax, JavaScript will have a certain syntax, and so on. And this is HTMLs. So it starts with an opening tag and a closing tag. And together, these two tags make up an HTML element. So yeah, let's take some questions next. Does anyone have any questions so far? Uh, have you? Yes, this will be available afterwards too. Uh, so don't worry about it. Uh, I also have previous ones. In fact, I'm going to be doing these more. So please come and check them out and always come and ask questions. If you're stuck on something, I'll be more than happy to help. Uh, what is the best way to learn coding? I think you know, definitely attending events like this where you can ask the tutor. So it's not just kind of uh, you know, going out and doing by yourself. Group settings like this always help because there's always help on hand. Or, you know, just um, trying it out by yourself afterwards by learning projects, maybe following on to a tutorial or two, and then trying to take that project to the next level. So, for example, if you want to learn how to make Tetris, you can follow one of my tutorials and then take it to the next level, style it as you want, kind of make it your own, add extra functionality to so that is the kind of uh, learning roadmap that I would say 
is good for learning how to code. Amy's struggling to understand child parent data sharing. Is this something I'll be able to understand eventually? Yes, of course. Is this child parent to do with React? Because I do have a great video on this that I would recommend. It's specifically about uh, actually sending data from the child to the parent, which is uh, the opposite of what you usually do, you usually feed data from the parent to the child. So do check that out. Um, and yeah, let me know what you think. So yeah, it's on my channel. Uh, you will definitely find it there. Or if not, try reach out to me on the Discord channel that I have under code with Anya. Dot com. <laughs> Vicky says, can you please make some Node.js projects? I have plenty on my channel. Please do check them out. Uh, in fact, what's the last one that I made? I can't remember, but there's definitely loads. I think most of my apps that I build are full site applications and like the majority of them use Node.js. So please um, do have a go at that. Or again, if you want to learn the fundamentals, then check out codewithanya.com and don't forget to use the, uh, the discount code that I gave. So let's go back to some learning. So obviously we have, let's recap, we have the first tag, which is the opening tag, and the second tag, which is a closing tag. And the whole thing makes up an HTML element. Right. So in this occasion, uh, we have made the text of lots in bold. So that's what it would look like. Opening tag, closing tag, and we can now use it. So, for example, here we are using it. It's standalone here, but we can also nest HTML elements sometimes in other elements. So, for example, I've got this lots, which is in bold, and I've nested it in a B element, which is a paragraph element. So then it looks like this. You can probably kind of tell it's a little bit more bold than the rest of the paragraph. So that's an example of how elements work in text. But there are a hundred plus HTML elements. There really is a lot. Here are the most common ones that I'm going to be covering, but there is so, so many out there for you to choose from. Uh, so just keep that in mind too. I'm just going to be covering the most popular ones because I think once you get the hang of them, you can kind of search other ones and you'll probably just end up using uh, a handful anyway. So these are some that exist. We've already covered the P element, which is the paragraph element. And you probably guessed is for writing paragraphs. So once again, we have the element which is an opening tag and then we have a closing tag and all together with the content this makes a paragraph element so it really is that easy next we also have headings now these as Najaf says also have semantic meaning uh, semantic meaning is something that we might cover a bit more later but essentially what this means so for example here we have an h1 element that is the most important heading you can put on your site, right? It's the most important. It's also the biggest visually, unless you want to change it with CSS. And it goes all the way down to H6. So in your browser, if you write this code, this, will, this is what it looks like. And this has semantic meaning. So what, the, what I mean by this is if you're writing an essay, right, you wouldn't really start the essay with this text, even if you wanted for some reason the title to be small. You would say this essay is about... I don't know, Shakespeare's best work. So you'd go with this level because it's the most important. It kind of accompanies what the essay is about. Same for a website. And then you do a subtitle maybe for your essay. So you've got Shakespeare's best work and then it could start off with being an introduction to Shakespeare. And then the less important the titles get, the lesser heading you would use. Now, why is this important for websites? This is because these also have semantic meaning, meaning that if you serve this up to the browser and then you publish it or whatever, you deploy it online, then Google will essentially use this title to kind of you know, understand what the whole website's about. So if you put Bobby's Burgers as the title of your, I'm gonna say title of your website, then Google will pick it up and it will be most likely displayed as the, um, you know, the, the content of your site when you go looking for it on search engines. 
So even if you want to use a big title somewhere else, lower down on your website, just because it looks visually great, don't use the H1. Use like the H5, but then you can change it later with CSS using a font size attribute. So just keep that in mind. This is something that I see beginners doing uh, quite a lot. And it's, it's just not, I guess it's just not correct, <laughs> for lack of better words. Great. So again, this is what we covered with semantic meaning. The browser will read certain text as more important than the rest based on the tags we give. Another great uh, element that I want to show you is the image element. This is actually very different to the other ones. I know I said there's an opening tag and a closing tag, and this makes up an HTML element. There are outliers to this rule, kind of like the image element, which just has one, right? It just has the one tag. Sometimes you see it closed off, sometimes you don't, and it takes information. Now, it takes the source, so the path to the image you want to display in the image element, and it also has this alt here. Again, I see beginners not using this at all sometimes, and it makes me really sad because this is for the visually impaired, essentially, and for screen readers. So if someone you know can't see the browser and they use a screen reader, and they come across this image element and it doesn't have an alt, then the screen reader won't pick it up or just say, this is an image, as opposed to, this is an image of dog snacks. So hopefully you see why that is important. And I would always recommend using the alt. OK, especially if you're going for a code interview, because someone sees that, be like, why do you do it? You need to tell them why. Uh, maybe just, I forgot. <laughs> but at least demonstrate that you know what it's for. Next up, I also want to show you this. So if in an HTML document you see this, this essentially means that it is commented out, meaning it will not be rendered in the browser. We comment stuff out, so essentially put this at the beginning, at this at the end, so kind of like here. If we don't want this to be put in the browser, if we just want to, you know, make a comment to someone else viewing our code, uh, or perhaps we comment out an element because we're not sure if it should belong there, but we don't want to delete it, we're not sure, so we can just comment it out. And it won't be seen. I'm going to show you how to do this soon. Before we get writing anything in our code editors, we also need to know that everything we've been writing so far, if I did put it in my code editor, so if I did this, hello, I am the main title, this would be invalid. This is because HTML documents are supposed to follow a specific pattern, which is this. And our page content essentially goes in between these body tags. So that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to write an HTML skeleton first. OK, so that's what we're doing. And we're going to be writing it in here. And one thing before we get going is when we start writing code, every time you write some code, we need to save the file. So this is a shortcut to doing so. I'm just going to press Control Save. And that will save the file. So for example, if I just type something, let's put a paragraph element. Hello, I am a paragraph. This is not saved, it's got a dot there, which means that if we serve this onto the browser, it will not get picked up. I need to save it so that little dot goes away. And now this is saved and this is what we're gonna serve to the browser. So just keep that in mind. But of course, we need to write the HTML. So save, refresh, save, refresh. I just wrote that as a reminder. We need to write the HTML for this first. So maybe let's just skip this. I seem to have repeated some of these. OK, so here we go. One second. Okay. So my HTML skeleton. Do you know what? I don't even remember this. I wouldn't really suggest. Uh, remembering the HTML, uh, it's called boilerplate code, uh, just because, I mean, you don't need that space being taken up in your brain. You can just go online. I like to use Jessica's uh, article, and all I really do is just copy this and paste it, okay? So that's all I have done. Let's get rid of these. And I'm just going to get rid of this link as we're not going to be linking our style sheet or the script tag for our JavaScript. And I'm just going to explain this a little bit more. 
So essentially, this first line right here, it tells you uh, it's, it's essentially a doc type declaration and it tells the browser what version of HTML the page is written in. So that's what it does. And this lang e is essentially just passing through the language as well. So it could be anything. Of course, I'm going to do this in English. So I've passed through en for English. Next, we have the head tags. Now, this head tag is not for a header. There is another header element, so don't get them confused. This is a head tag. Uh, and it essentially contains information that is processed by the machine, so you won't see it. Uh, it's called metadata that lives in here, okay? And it'll do things such as give the title to the document. However, let's go ahead and copy this again. So copy path and go back to here and paste it, you will see it doesn't show up, right? And you might be like, weird, but we've given it a title. Surely it should show up here. It doesn't. It actually shows up there. So we have named this document, and it shows up in the tab. So once again, I'm just going to show you. Maybe let's change this to Anya's portfolio. Save it, right? Save it so there's no dot. Refresh and his portfolio. Ta-da! So that is what the title does. You can use something like Live Server. Of course, this is very beginner though, so I don't want to confuse people with Live Server. But there is a way that Live Server essentially allows you not to have to refresh it each time. But I think maybe for beginners that could be confusing. Maybe not. At least now you know it exists. So after that, we also have a bunch of other stuff. The UTF-8 encoding is kind of interesting. It essentially is the thing that allows us to view things such as, you know, not just uh, English language like this, as we specified English, but characters such as Arabic or this little funky dude right here. So that is all thanks to this UTF-8 char set right here. Next up, we also have the viewport meta tag. And this tag essentially renders the width of a page to the width of the device's screen size. So if you have a mobile device that is 600 pixels wide, then the browser window will also be 600 pixels wide. I know my laptop battery is also triggering me, Andy. We're on 7%, but it's, it's quite a good laptop. I mean, I could get my charger, but I have faith. I like to live on the edge. <laughs> Ah, okay, maybe at 2%, I'll go get my charger. Anyway, so that is what the viewport does. And then the initial scale, which controls the zoom level, is this. So if you want to zoom in more, you can change that. Just have a play around with it. Uh, again, this is just for viewing. It, essentially, like um, if you're in a mobile and you want the page of so the width of the device of screen size, uh, that will essentially be kind of constrained to it. The UXA compatible, uh, this tag specifies the document mode for Internet Explorer. And this is essentially the highest supported mode for this right here. So just keep that in mind. I wouldn't really worry about it. Just put it in there for now. As a beginner, it's not probably the most important thing to be worrying about at this moment. And we've, of course, explained the title tag. So don't use the title tag in here. Uh, the body element is essentially what's going to hold anything we want to see in the browser. But this one won't. I don't think it'll work. I've never tried it. Should we see? It's definitely wrong. Okay, no, it doesn't. So for to view this title, we know what we should use, right? What should we use? We've looked at it before. We want to have a heading on our websites. Anyone know what I should give this? If I want to name my website something in the browser, if I want to give it like a main title. I would use the H1 element. So it's the most important heading that we can use. It's H1. And it just means that if I refresh it, whoa, there it is. Again, this is different to H2, a sub heading. So just like that. Ta-da. There we go. And as we know, they both have different semantic meaning. This one will be treated as the most important uh, heading on our site. Great. Adam was right, he wrote H1. Samir also wrote H1. This is fantastic.
So great, hopefully you guys are uh, up to this part of the tutorial. Uh, I'm just gonna continue so that we can get to some fun stuff in a bit. So we also have something called lists. So we just looked at individual kind of tags, mainly headings, paragraphs. Uh, we didn't look at emphasis, but this again is easy. So maybe let's make a paragraph element. I am some text, blah, blah, blah. So this will look like this. This is a paragraph element. Now, if I want to make this bold, I did show you the B element to make something bold, right? So that will now be bold. However, this actually doesn't have semantic meaning. The browser will not pick this up. So if you're using a text reader, it will just read it as I am some text, blah, blah, blah. To make this semantic, I need to use strong. So this will now be picked up by a uh, screen reader. It's still visually bold, but now a screen reader will go, I am some text, blah, 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 probably. I don't know <laughs> however the screen readers would read that out, but it would definitely be bold. Uh, another thing we can do is make something italic. So once again, this has no semantic meaning but it looks italic and this has semantic meaning. So it will look italic, but also the screen reader will read it as italic. So there we go. Okay, great. So that is some things that we can do with text. These are kind of very simple, right? We have nested some uh, an element inside an element here, but one element that needs to be realistically nested in something else is lists, so list items. So we can have list item elements. So I am the first list item. Then we have I am the second list item. and I am the third list item. And we need to wrap them in either an unordered list. So we put them all in here. Okay, and now they're in a list, it's not ordered. It's just got the little bullet points, right? So that is something that exists. Or we can put them in an ordered list. So if I change this out, it goes one, two, three. So that is an order list as opposed to an unordered list. So just keep those two in mind because they obviously have very different uses. If you're writing steps for which order they come in, or if you're not, then just do the unordered list. Fine, if you're just like listing out ingredients. So knowing when to use the right one is also a skill in itself. So once again, unordered list and order list. Now comes the fun part. So hopefully, uh, this is a little exercise for you. We've got 20 minutes, and this is probably a good time for me to go and charge my laptop. I want you to essentially use everything we've learned so far to make your own project. I just want you to make a new project and call it HTML project one, then make an HTML page to go in it, so, and add it to HTML project one, insert some boilerplate code. So you know what boilerplate code is, is the thing I stole of Jessica Wilkins on Free Code Camp. And then when you're ready to continue, unpause and just let me know. So let's do it. I'm gonna leave you to it. Uh, let's give it like three minutes. And yeah, then I'm gonna carry on. I'm gonna show you how to do it just as a quick refresher so we can carry on. I just wanna make sure that everyone's kind of uh, at the right point. And if not, comment and I will help you out. So yeah, do it and I'm going to get my charger. <laughs> and I'm plugged in, nice.
Okay, so how is everyone doing on this? Is anyone kind of following along live? I'm just going to, I'm going to maybe keep up this boilerplate code just because, you know, in case you can't find the thing that I Googled, which is fair enough. I did only show you very quickly, but essentially this is the boilerplate code that you need to write. Maybe let's put this on a new line. Like so, because actually it doesn't matter. You can put this on many different lines, right? It will get picked up the same way in the browser. So that really doesn't matter to us. Okay, so the way I would do this is, it's gonna get rid of that. Let's get rid of that and just start empty, right? And then What I'm going to do is create a new project. We want to call it HTML project one. So I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call it HTML project one. So just rename it like so. And next we're going to get up VS code. So get up VS code and open it up. So I'm going to go to my desktop, find it and open it up. Just like so. Yes, trust the authors. And once I'm in the project, I make a full file index and I use the HTML extension. And there we go. Now I put in the boilerplate. So once again, I am going to go to, this is the website that I use for this. Okay, if you wanna copy that out or uh, take a screenshot, but essentially it's, an article that Jessica wrote and provides us with the boilerplate codes. I'm just going to copy that, paste it in like so, and get rid of the stuff I don't need, which is the script tag and the link tag right here. Okay. And then what else do we need to do? Let's just call it HTML project one. Okay. So there we go. And hopefully we're at the right place and everyone's in the right place so we can now carry on because now we're going to look at links so links are another fun element because we can link stuff up so for example make sure to write this in the body right otherwise this won't get picked up i can use an a link uh click me to go to my youtube channel and the way this works is that we need to add an href attribute okay so at the moment, once again, I'm just going to copy the path and then we paste it in like so. Once again, we're going into users, into the annual Kubo user, onto my desktop, finding the project called, or the folder called HTML project one and getting the index HTML file. And then this comes up. However, it doesn't look like a link. It looks like some text, right? This is because we didn't give it the href attribute. So I'm gonna go href, and then we're gonna pass through some text in these quote marks, and that is to my YouTube. So Anya Kubo YouTube. And I'm just gonna get this URL, right? So I'm just gonna copy that. And now I'm gonna paste it in like so. Once again, I'm just going to maybe put this on a new line so it's more readable. We can do that because it will get picked up just the same as you will see, oops. Copy that path again, copy path. Okay, there we go. However, now it's a link. It looks like a link, right? We can click on it. If we hover over it, it does that. And if we click on it, it goes to my YouTube channel. So that's how you'd make a link. You can also link not just to um, external pages, by the way, we can link to, uh, we can link to places on our document so if you want to click on here it can take you to a title way further down on the page or scroll down to that title you might have seen that on websites before okay so for to do this you would use a hash there and then you would link it to the id but that is something we will cover later you can also link it to pages so for example you know like we had pages here and then two documents we would go into pages and then get the HTML element, HTML page that we are after. So in this occasion, we're going into pages, then we have the slash, which means it's kind of like a doorway in and out of the folder. 
and then we get that HTML page. So you know how we call the index HTML before? We can also call it about me. So I'm going to show you how to do this. I think this is kind of interesting. So first off, let's go ahead and create a folder called pages. And in it, I'm going to put about me HTML, just like we saw. Now, if I want to, let's make another A element. Go to about me. I need to now link that page. So what I would do is I would go into pages, right? Into the pages folder. And then we're going to go into that folder. So it's like a doorway into the folder. And we're going to get the About Me HTML page. So now if I refresh this, let's make this bigger. And we are on the index HTML page, right? If you can see it in the URL, that's where we are. And if I click on here, it then goes to Pages About Me. So we're literally navigating pages now, okay? This is what you can do with HTML, right? Already you can see that it's starting to get a little bit more, I don't wanna say complicated, but definitely more interesting, right? Um, so that is something that you can do. So yeah, you can go to URLs, you can go to different pages on the, different elements on the page, or you can go to different pages uh, completely. So that is something to consider. Now, if you want to go back, here's the doorway, right? You use the dot, dot. So for example, let's go to here. I'm going to make an A element again. Go to home page. Okay? So now, to link this, well, I'm here. So I can't go into a folder. There's no folder to go into. I need to go back out of this folder. So I'm on this level and into the index HTML. So to go back, I need to go out of pages, I go out of pages, and then I go to index HTML. So let's see if that has worked. So I'm on the About Me HTML page, and if I click on here, it goes back to the home page, the index HTML, and I'll go back to Go About Me, and it goes to the About Me page. So now I can go back and forth, back and forth. And we're just essentially uh, navigating through our folder so all the files in here. So here's the index HTML, here's the pages, and here's the about me page. Great. Hopefully that makes sense. So let's continue. So we've kind of already discussed this. We've got the project folder here. We've got my portfolio, or in this case, HTML project one, and we're going into pages and we're getting the about me page and then we're also navigating out of it, okay? So once again, visually, um, that is it. Next, let's also cover images. So how would you show an image, right? Well, we know it's this, uh, but how would we actually get that image in there? So let's go back to the home page. Maybe I'm going to save this file. And I'm going to use the image element. And you can do a closing tag. It's up to you. We need a source, and we also need the alt. So what should we put in here? Um, we could put whatever. I can even take it from the actual uh, internet itself. So I don't know, let's put Coca-Cola can, just because I have one here and it's the first thing I saw. If I go to images, uh, maybe let's go to Wikipedia. That's always a good one to take from Wikipedia. Okay, I can copy the image address. Okay, so all I've done is right click, left click on this, copy image address. And now here, as the source, I would just paste that. Okay, that's all I've done as an alternative, a Coca-Cola bottle is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to save that. And now if I refresh this, go to the home page, there's a Coca-Cola bottle on my website, a very basic website, but it's there. And we can change how this looks with CSS later on. So again, CSS is the styling where we can manipulate how tall this is, how big it is, whether it's in a circle, whatever we want. So that is something we can do. We can also store these images. So instead of save, getting the image uh, address, I can save this image. So let's just go Coca-Cola. I'm going to save it in on desktop, actually. So save, 
Another thing I can do is if I want to keep images in here, because you know that image that I took off Wikipedia could go down, someone could take it down and this will not work, right? Because there's an external source, we have no control over it. So you might want to create a new folder called images. And now you can essentially just drag in that image. So all I'm going to do is just dragging that image into here. So Coca-Cola JPEG, and it just means that now instead of this source, so let's just get rid of all of it. I can, once again, we need to go into images, so we're here, we need to go into here because it's on the same level, right? It's on the same level as this images. So let's go into it and then we can get the Coca-Cola JPEG. So Coca-Cola JPEG and there we go. So now once again, it will, it will look the same. We've just replaced it with an image from our folder rather than online. So that's what we have done. Okay, great. So hopefully that explains the image uh, tag a little bit better. Uh, if it's broken, like I said, then you will receive this. So that's, again, why I wouldn't really use images off the internet. And I just choose to save them in your project. Now, we've covered a lot of elements. This one is probably the most complicated one as it involves a lot of nesting elements. And it's the table element. And the table element has a wrapping element, so the parent. And then it has table rows. So these, I've got three rows in here and visually it will look like this. So not too bad, right? Kind of understandable, but wait, in the table rows, we then have table headings. So that's the table heading one, that's table heading two. Okay, we've added that. And then we also need to add table data. So you're like, whoa, there's so much nesting going on here just to make a table. But essentially, this is what it will look like. So there's a lot to do here. And there's more as well. You can add ones with semantic meaning, telling it that this is the table header. And this is the table body. So this is the table header in light pink. And this is the table body. So the table element is one that is super interesting. Uh, and you can basically just go ahead and use it. We will be using it to create a table tennis leaderboard in one of the projects. I'm just going to just do, like zoom through it a little bit because I really want to cover divs before we finish because divs are actually my favorite. They're actually like this uh, little ghost essentially of an element because they don't really have any kind of styling to it. It's like literally invisible. Div is the content division element officially, but everyone just calls them divs. And it essentially allows us to create visual boxes like so once you add CSS. Okay, so stuff like this is something you can create with divs. However, I would also recommend using pre-made elements that have semantic meaning. So for example, here you'd use the header element. For this, you'd probably use an article. And for this, you'd use the footer element. So just keep those in mind. Divs, however, look like this. And you can contain a data with them. So for example, you might want to wrap this H1 element and this P element in a div to make sure that they are kind of clumped together, especially when it comes to arranging stuff on a site. Okay, and you will see these are nested inside that div. So we've got an opening element, uh, open, opening tag and a closing tag as well. Okay, so yes, yeah, so divs are essentially like little ghosts that don't have any semantic meaning, they're, they're just kind of there to keep stuff together. And then you can also style them up to give them any shape you want. So these are also the semantic sectioning elements that I talked about. We have the header, like I said, it's the header of a site and it typically holds stuff like website logos or search bars and titles. We also have the footer, which is kind of self-explanatory. We use it for information about companies and so on. And then the nav, which is a navigation, which usually holds links to other pages like we've kind of created so far. That should probably go in a nav element. And then we also have sections. So that is something that we can have on our site. Uh, sections should always have headings in them. Just keep that in mind. Um, I sometimes see people not using this, but this is the correct way to do it. You should have a heading in them. 
And then we also have articles. So an article could literally be an article, a newspaper article, right? Like a newspaper site will probably have loads of these on there. It could also be used for a blog entry or a product card. So for example, on Amazon, all each of the products are probably, the data is probably mapped onto article elements. So just keep uh, that in mind. So these are some semantic sectioning elements, okay? There is a lot more. Of course, we've just covered the ones that are probably the most popular ones, but you also have stuff like figure, fig caption, and so on. All of these will have semantic sectioning uh, meaning. So now it's time for the table tennis leaderboard, and I'm going to leave you here because I want you to essentially create an HTML project too, add the boilerplate code to it after creating a file in it, an HTML page, and then we're going to recreate a table tennis leaderboard. So that's what I want you to do. Uh, before moving on, and I'm going to leave you here because uh, I want you to go ahead and do this, have fun creating a leaderboard, uh, make it like whatever you want, ha make it have a, it can have an image of table tennis, it can have a table for the, I guess, highest scores and so on. Uh, and once you are done with that, I hope you can join me on the Code with Anya community um, where you can share your kind of leaderboard with me. I'd love to see what you've made. If you don't, don't want to join the community, then please share it with me on Twitter, like a screenshot or anything. And I'd love to kind of give you feedback if you're open to that or just in general, just, uh, yeah, just see what you have done. So that's where I'm going to leave you. If you want to carry on with this HTML uh, part, please do visit codewithania.com. Once again, here is all the content that you would cover for the HTML section that I kind of just zipped through. And you've got I Love Coding 20 to get 20% off as well. So do check it out. Uh, or if not, just check out my other videos because we do cover a lot of HTML pretty much in every single project. So yeah, that is it. For those of you wanting to know what you can find my Discord and um, continue with this course, it's codewithania.com. So great. Thank you so much for watching today. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if I could have explained something better or if you'd like to learn anything else. Uh, and I hope to see you again soon on one of these or just on one of my premieres, which I do most Wednesdays. So do check that out. And yeah, just have a good day and I'll see you later. Bye.